Many people are raised in American culture to know that our entire history of our nation was based on the pilgrims who came across the very turbulent and tumultuous seas to find a place to worship the Lord without the tyranny of a king's ship. And I'm probably getting those old language terms incorrect, but you can correct me in your hearts and minds and souls, and that's okay. It's not a form of rebuke if you are more familiar with those terms in any way. The reality is I'm trying to remind you of the purpose of America, that the purpose of America was to praise the Lord. When we got here, we pretty much lucked out because we would have been snuffed out in America by the native Indian tribes, of which there was many bloody wars and many difficulties, if one set of Indians didn't try to save the lives through their version of God, of our people who believe in God. And as a result, we had a lot of cross-cultural interactions and some cross-cultural relationships and some cross-cultural love relationships. And diversity began back then. In America, we have also the right to freedom of religion underneath the First Amendment of our United States Constitution provided to our citizens and offered in a way to people who are visiting America who might like to visit a famous chapel or a famous church or a famous synagogue or a famous place such as Salem that has something to do with witchcraft or basically something historic and unique to America. It's tourism, if you will, at its finest. Much like many military men, much like my late father, loved to travel to different battle sites and visit different places like Gettysburg to get a feel of history back then. If you believe in polytheism, it means that you accept that the architectural aspects and the anthropological aspects of the written word about the Lord is primarily truth-based fact-based and whether you're dealing with exegesis or whether you're dealing with hermeneutics of the Aramaic anthropological studies of God isn't really the issue the issue is that you accept that there was at some point a splitting of the nation into many little nations that all went off and pursued their own versions in their own cultures and their own languages of God. So for me, because I had an interest in college and overseas about God, I began my own hobby-oriented reading. And before I went overseas, I had that interest in college, in philosophy, and other things. So I like classic literature. I like Marcus Aurelius. I like several of the Catholic saints. And I've read a variety of books from different perspectives on God. I am not someone who will tout the Tao, but I am someone who open to Buddhism, Shintoism, Confucianism, and other aspects of Chinese history in terms of educational systems that came after him. In life, I also lived abroad in Japan, so I am familiar with the gods of thunder and the gods of lightning and the god Amaterasu, which was a matriarch rather than a patriarch, that is the creator of Japanese society. Japanese history books also get a bit of notoriety from the fact that the Koshiki will not be released according to the government for any reason whatsoever because God forbid we figure out or we learn that Japan evolved out of a mix of Korean and Chinese people or something Mongolian or something Altaic which is basically what the language is based on. But the reality is that when you're a world-oriented person, when you're an internationalized version of a U.S. citizen, you respect and regard that there are many types of ways and many paths to the Lord's house. Most religions you can find a comparative analysis upon by this time in our history of 2021. Many of those comparative works have been 
handled for the last century, probably. Because people like to explore and they like to travel and they like to look at things from different perspectives. Most of those religions have pretty standard principles that are all pretty much the same. Thou shall have no God before me. Thou shall not commit adultery, although we all do that in our minds, hearts, and souls, without thinking about it today, if we simply regard the human being. I'm not making light about that. I'm just saying that many of us have sinned in life and in love. At the same time, we learn thou shall not steal and thou shall not covet. Because coveting is the beginning of theft. Also, entitlement thinking is the beginning of theft and abuse. So a polytheistic-oriented pagan acknowledges different versions of religion and different versions about the principles and practices of the Lord's house of which there's mainly one mother and father, God, or one primary, de primary deity. It doesn't mean that there aren't minor deities, and it doesn't mean that there aren't important prophets, and it doesn't mean that there aren't different types of Gaelic, and Scottish, and English, and, Britain, sorry, and Japanese, or Chinese, or Korean words for God. Thailand is full of temples about God. You see, you have to be a world traveler, not at all. You have to be an internalized, internationalized mind to some point to understand it all. There are certainly people more educated, more robust about different versions of religions in the world, and you can find them at our finest universities across the nation. But the bottom line is, when it comes to the daily practice of one's faith, you have the right to choose the version of the Lord that you most feel is best for you from which to take. At the same time, my clairvoyant friend Claudia reminded me that when your faith or your spirituality gets stale, it's important to change it up. And I would attend a weekly class on Tuesdays for a while while I was dealing with the loss of a very, very special friend to my life <clears throat> outside the decline of my father's life to learn about different types of divination and different types of faith practices that help to excite me about the pursuit of God. I also visited a hermitage and studied with a Franciscan monk who was apparently, according to online information, very much the rebel. But to me, he was pretty cool because he spoke eight languages. And he was in his 80s, and he was a world traveler, and he practiced his faith pretty well without being too terribly tainted. The problem I found in most organizations, whether they were big or small, is then a lack of walk and talk. Walk Your Talk is an old time book from probably the early 90s about leadership, but it is a phrase and a set of phrases that many of us who had to be interpreters and translators in business often had to utilize to express concepts of whether or not what you say is what you're doing. In my life, what I say is what I'm doing. Only maybe three times officially in my life, outside of dealing with family of origin, did I not follow through on the things of which I promised. One was a business transaction that fell through because a deal of mine fell through and I couldn't then transfer the money from that deal to the purchase of a membership in an Indiana chamber. To this day, I still sort of reel over that disappointment of mine because I had given my word to a man that I would. But I couldn't do it at that time because of a fluke that I didn't anticipate or expect. But when you're running a small business, things like that do happen. The second 
was with a girlfriend of mine who was a business colleague, a fast forming friend, and openly I was supposed to call her on a Wednesday night to work some details out of our little fight and I just couldn't do it because I had so much going on at home with my wife. And openly, I regret it to this day. In every way. The third item is not really of consequence to you and I'm not going to share it with you. But the bottom line is that when you're a person of faith, you try to follow through. 